really like mini PCs. They're compact, versatile, and most recently have been pretty solid deals when it comes to gaming. But we're not talking about that today. Instead, I want to take a look at AMD's latest Ryzen 9 AI 370HX as a server platform and see if it has what it takes to be your next Proxmox server. Welcome back to Graft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. It was a little over a year ago that I decided to take a look at Proxmox on Intel's hybrid CPU architecture. Since 12th generation, Intel has been using a mix of core types in their CPUs, a set of high power performance cores for demanding applications like games or workstation apps, and a lower power set of efficiency cores to handle more basic tasks like web browsing and background services. Both Intel and AMD have performance and efficiency cores in their enterprise products, but they don't mix them into a single package. Hybrid designs with both P&E cores have existed on Intel's side of things for a little while, both on their desktop and their mobile platforms. But with AMD's latest release of Zen 5 mobile chips, they've also started introducing mixed CPU types into a single package. The Ryzen AI9HX370, for example, is a 12-core, 24-threaded CPU with four Zen 5 cores and eight Zen 5C efficiency cores. And that got me thinking back to my Intel hybrid tests from a year ago, wondering if AMD might have some of the same problems that we ran into from Intel and the Linux CPU scheduler. Well, you know, there's only one way to find out. On my desk today is the AceMagic F3A mini PC, and thanks to AceMagic for sending this out for this project. As I mentioned, this one is loaded up with AMD's latest Ryzen AI9 HX370, which I'll be calling the HX370 for the remainder of this video because it's a stupid name. It's again a 12-core CPU with four full Zen 5 cores, which can boost up to 5.1 GHz, along with eight Zen 5C efficiency cores, which can hit 3.3 GHz on their own. I've got this loaded up with 32 gigabytes of DDR5 5600 memory and a pair of 2.5 gigabit Intel i226 network cards. For storage, we went with a pair of Silicon Power 1.92 terabyte Gen 4x4 NVMe drives, which will serve as both our boot drive as well as VM storage inside of Proxmox. Installation was pretty straightforward, if not a little comical. The top panel here is toolless, so you can take it off with just a slide of a switch on the back. However, once you have lifted the top panel, the only thing you have access to is the fan. There are four screws on an acrylic top panel that you need to remove before you can get to the NVMe drives. So it's toolless, so long as all you want to do is look at it. Of course, the HX370 is also an APU, rocking 16 compute units of RDNA 3.5 graphics horsepower, which in this particular application is kind of a waste. It's often difficult or impossible to pass through integrated graphics to a virtual machine. And even if you could, it's not like the Radeon 890M is the most powerful GPU on the planet. It gets easily outclassed by even an RX 6400. And for traditional home lab tasks like video transcoding, software support is pretty hit or miss. So for this video, we're only going to focus on the CPU and how Proxmox performs with this hybrid architecture. First off, there's a couple things to note about Proxmox. As of the time of filming, the latest version is 8.3, and it ships with kernel version 6.8 by default. However, the Linux CPU scheduler patches for the HX370 weren't added to the Linux kernel until version 6.11, and it's not an automatic update in Proxmox yet. While performance under kernel 6.8 was okay, I would highly recommend upgrading to kernel 6.14 if you plan on using the CPU. I'll link the Proxmox forum post down in the video description with instructions on how to opt in to the 6.14 update. It's a pretty simple process of adding the non-subscription apt repo and then installing the new kernel. With the update applied, how am I planning on testing performance today? Similar to my testing on Intel Raptor Lake, I decided to run Windows Server 2025 VMs and run Cinebench R23. It's intensive, it's predictable, and it's scalable, and the results are pretty easy to parse out, making it a great option for CPU performance comparisons. With 24 CPU threads, there are a number of different ways that I could split up the CPU, but I decided to go for eight threads per virtual machine in my first set of tests with up to three VMs, and one final round with four VMs and six threads each. Starting off, let's get some native performance numbers running Windows on bare metal to give these tests some context. In Cinebench R23, the HX370 managed a multi-threaded score of 21,033, along with a 1992 single-threaded score. Running a single VM, I did make sure to test with both kernel 6.8 and 6.14, and the results make it clear you want the latest scheduler patch. 
Single threaded scores were down to 1435 on the older version with a score of 1796 in the latest update. Without the patch, the scheduler will randomly assign either a Zen 5 or a Zen 5 C core, giving you wildly inconsistent performance results. Also with a single VM, I tried manually assigning CPU affinity as well to force the virtual machine to use either performance or efficiency cores. What I found was it's actually better to let Linux figure it out at the host and hardware level. While we got a slightly higher single threaded result when locked to performance cores, 1852 versus 1796, there was a massive drop in multi-threaded performance from 11,272 down to 9,170. While locking to efficiency cores did bring down the performance level, I still would say it's better to let the host determine where to allocate cores, especially as you increase the number of VMs and services that you're running. Now, the reason I'm testing with eight threads in this VM is because that's how many threads of Zen 5 performance cores this CPU has. In a single VM, we should be seeing some loss in performance from overhead, but nothing too drastic. And in single threaded, we see about an 11% drop from bare metal to the VM more than I was expecting, but also not a terrible result. As we increase the number of VMs running, instead of just using the Zen 5 performance cores, Linux will automatically be adding in Zen 5C efficiency cores to the mix. The question is whether or not performance still scales predictably, or if it drops off a cliff with Linux having no clue how to allocate the different core types. Or if you remember back to my Raptor-like video, completely crashes the host because of incompatibility with this hybrid architecture. Let's find out. Jumping in with two virtual machines, each again configured with eight threads, and Proxmox handling the scheduling and affinity automatically, we see scores of 8,011 and 8,138 in multi-threaded, or around a 28% drop in performance from running a single VM. That does make sense, as we are now leaning on those Zen 5C efficiency cores to help fill in some of the compute. The interesting thing here, though, was in the single-threaded test, with the scores dropping down a bit to 1,673. In theory, this should only be one thread of Zen 5 each, and we should still be seeing upwards of 1,800 points. Instead, we're down 19% from the bare metal test, which is quite a bit more than I expected. Running three VMs, again, each with eight threads, should max us out for CPU allocation, as we only have a total of 24 threads to work with in this server. If you remember back to when I tested this on Intel Raptor Lake, the default Linux scheduler hard crashed in the system. I'm hoping support for AMD's multi-core hybrid CPU is a bit further along than that. And to be fair, along with some of the microcode updates, Intel hybrid CPUs are very well supported in Linux and virtualization setups today. With three VMs, we get an average multi-threaded score of 6,161. That's a combined score of 18,464, which is only around 12% behind the bare metal score of 21,033. Pretty impressive overall, considering we're using every single thread with nothing left over for Proxmox to manage itself with. Unfortunately, single-threaded scores dropped again, from a native score of 1992 to 1796 with one VM, 1673 with a pair, and now 1530 when running three. That's a 24% drop in single-threaded performance when there should be really no reason for it. The CPU isn't being thermally or power limited when running three individual threads at 100%, with the rest sitting at idle. And finally, I tested four VMs running six threads each, again for a total of 24 threads in use. In multi-threaded, we get an average score of 4,344, or an aggregate total score of 17,377, slightly below our 3VM test and around a 17% loss to overhead compared to bare metal. But still what I'd consider to be an impressive result, given this is still just a 45-watt laptop CPU running four individual virtual machines. Single-threaded performance again fell off, though, this time with an average of 1,437, or around 28% below the bare metal numbers. While not nearly as impressive, that's still well above the mark set when testing the Zen 5C efficiency cores, which only managed 1,166 in a single VM, when affinity is set manually for the Zen 5C cores. So why am I bothering testing Proxmox on a mini PC? Aren't more home labbers buying server racks and stacks of used enterprise equipment to run their virtualization anyway? If you watch channels like mine, you might think that that's exactly the case. Myself, I have a couple of 64 core Epic CPUs, over a terabyte of memory and around 400 terabytes of storage, along with 100 gigabit networking to sling all that data around. But let's back up a little bit. 
In 2017, buying some used Xeons was a fantastic deal to get a ton of performance. Modern CPUs were still Intel 7th Gen quad cores, and you could pick up 8 or 12 core Xeon chips for less than 100 bucks. Motherboards also began to drastically drop in price as well, making used enterprise gear that much more appealing. But over the last five years, the cost of enterprise hardware has not only flatlined, it's gone up in some cases. This Supermicro H11 SSL motherboard, which is for first generation Epic Naples, I bought this back in 2020 for $325. This board today, still sells on eBay for $420. Enterprise hardware cycles have been spread out a bit further than usual following the global pandemic, along with economic uncertainty from the last couple years. With less medium-sized businesses cycling out servers for new gear, there's less used gear on the market. And with everyone and their mother wanting to build themselves GPU servers for the AI craze, demand for high-end components and platforms that can support multiple GPUs has skyrocketed, keeping used prices out of reach for most people, especially in the home lab space. But there is a bit of a bright side to all of this. Consumer CPUs have gotten damn fast in the last three to four years. So fast, in fact, that this one mini PC powered by an AMD HX370 mobile CPU drawing just 45 watts is faster than every single X99 Xeon that has ever been made. And while the bare bones kit from Ace Magic will set you back around $650, it also sips on power, drawing just 93 watts at peak for the entire system, measured from the wall with idle consumption closer to 10 watts. 10 watts doesn't even cover the fan for a Broadwell Xeon system or the 250 watt power draw from a single CPU system under full load. You can also build yourself systems with something like a Minis Forum BD790i, which uses the Ryzen 7945HX 16 core Zen 4 CPU that is an absolute baller when it comes to both virtualization and overall single threaded performance. Unless we start to see prices for used gear drop, which I don't necessarily see happening anytime soon, the home lab scene may start to shift from full server racks and a thousand watts of power draw to maybe some simpler and lower power systems, especially for VM hosts and general purpose servers. Enterprise gear is definitely a lot of fun to play with, but if prices remain high, consumer gear is starting to make more and more sense. And with power draw for modern enterprise CPUs climbing well above 450 watts per socket, consumer gear is likely going to be the future of home labs anyway. Thanks again to Ace Magic for sending out the F3A for this project. If you're interested in what is a very solid mini PC and in AMD Ryzen AI9 HX370 APU, I will have links down below on where you can pick one up for yourself. On your way down there, make sure to drop this video a like and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on social media at Craft Computing for daily shenanigans like this. And if you like the content you see on this video and want to help support me in what I do, consider joining the Patreon. Link is also down in the video description. And that's going to do it for me in this one. Thank you all so much for watching. And as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, everyone. You know, some beers you pick up just for the can art, and with Level Beer, there's never an exception to that rule. Uh, this is the Level Beer Rebellions Are Built on Hops uh, Galactic IPA, clocking in at somewhere around 6.7%. Look at that. Crystal clear IPA. Wow. Boy, first impressions. Very crisp. I really like this one. I really like this beer. Super, super cold. Uh, normally, my beers warm up just slightly before I start filming. This one came right out of the fridge. I really like this beer. Super cold. I was enjoying this beer so much, I forgot to review it. Um, like I said in the, the intro, the first couple of sips, I really liked this beer cold. And in fact, it got even better as it warmed up just a little bit. It's probably between 45 and 50 degrees right now. Um, so it's it's not necessarily chilly anymore. Flavor-wise, again, super crisp, super refreshing. Um, I didn't exactly expect this from 
a Northwest IPA. Typically those are a little bit danker, a little bit deeper, but with Level, they, they dabble with all kinds of styles of IPA. Uh, really, really enjoy what they do. Uh, rebellions are built on hops. <laughs> That's just such a great freaking can. This has a lot of the hallmarks of a West Coast IPA, like a, I'd say a stone IPA. Without bludgeoning you over the head with it. The front of the flavor starts out very pilsnery, uh, very light, and like I've said, like five or six times already, crisp. Um, and then it kind of slowly fades into a very familiar Northwest IPA, bitter IPA, but without going too crazy with it. And in fact, the bitterness continues to build well after you finish your drink. Um, but again, it's nothing too insane. This is a really, really drinkable IPA, even if you're not a huge fan of IPAs. If, you, if your normal jam is you're starting to get into craft beer and you're starting to get into, hey, maybe I like Pilsners and Lagers, but maybe I like a good session IPA or a, a 10 barrel pub beer or a Rainier, like you're just starting to broach that subject. I think this is a really good entry into IPAs. It's refreshing. It's good. It has all the right flavors, all without being too terribly intense. It's going to let you know within the first couple of sips whether or not you should continue trying to taste some new IPAs. And I like that for it.